Damn, you're delicious. in a therapist's office. <laughs> Time is ticking. Hi guys, it's Meredith. We have a listener warning in full effect, much like a tornado warning here in Kansas. This is a really great episode, you guys. Um, but yeah, lots of language, lots of perhaps triggering topics for some of you. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a overall warning. We talk, this episode is with Britt Frank, and I'm going to introduce her in just a second. But we talk about a lot of issues. She's a psychotherapist, so we touch on everything from eating disorders to sexual addiction to childhood trauma and everything kind of in between there. So definitely don't listen with children nearby and perhaps you might want to be somewhere that's kind of cool to handle this kind of stuff. So this is probably one of the most raw podcasts I've ever done. And it's because Britt is the type of person and therapist who completely puts you at ease and disarms you. (laughs) And um, that's a good thing, right? Right. But we had a really great time. We actually sat and talked for quite a while after we were done. And, um, you know, when you just meet those people and you just like them, she's definitely one of those peeps. So I hope you all enjoy this episode. Do know that it has some sensitive topics and let's roll into it. So apparently today is a day that everyone is going to mow in every corner of every yard in Kansas. (laughs) I have been trying to record the introduction to this particular podcast for well over three hours. And at this point, I just give up and we're just going to roll with the mowers. I'm sorry, guys. (laughs) Isn't it fitting that that's the episode with the psychotherapist, right? What do you say about this? What did the lawnmowers mean, Britt? Today's guest is Britt Frank. She is a speaker, teacher, and therapist working with adults and children here in Kansas, where I live for the time being. One of the things I love that she says that I also say is you are not broken. You are not crazy. Nothing is wrong with you. And many people hear therapy and think they're going to have to retell like their entire stories. And she confirms that's not true. So I just love everything that Britt is doing. I wanted to have her on so you guys can definitely go follow her on Instagram. That is where the magic is happening right now, guys. You can follow her on Instagram at b.e.frank. And I hope you all enjoy this in-person interview with Britt Frank. Welcome to the Same 24 Hours Podcast with Meredith Atwood. We all have the same 24 hours each day, and it's what we do with those hours that makes all the difference between our health, happiness, and success. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Same 24 Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Atwood. I am in person interviewing Britt Frank. Hello. Hi, Meredith. So Britt is a psychotherapist and trauma specialist, and we thought we would have this very light, airy interview (laughs) in person. (laughs) She is Britt, not Brittany, and we were talking about that before we started. So tell me a little bit about Britt and important it is to call someone by the name that they're given, that they want to be called, right? The name that they choose. It's so funny. The conversation I've been having since I made is, what's your name? It's Britt. Is that short for Brittany? No. Are you sure? Like... Yes, I'm sure. Thank you, though. <laughs> I'm absolutely positive. And then, the, well, what does it say on your driver's license? As if I wasn't, thank you so much. I didn't know. You're right. My name is actually Brittany. Right. So it actually is important that people feel a sense of choice over do they want to be called by their given name or do they prefer another name? It matters. Yeah. And like calling someone a name, whether it's a nickname or, you know, even a pet. I hate the word pet. <laughs> uh, pet name. Um, that's, you know power, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. to choose how you, what you call someone is very significant. It is. And luckily my parents don't tech, but you know, my, (laughs) I was in New York seeing them and my father was all like, Hey kiddo. And like little girl, it's like, ew, no, I'm I'm grown. And actually Brit will do just fine. Thank you. It matters. 
Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, I've ca- always called my kids monkeys and stuff like that. Maybe they don't want to be called animals. But I know my son likes monkey. And then recently he's taken to calling us mother and father. <laughs> How's that land for you? <laughs> so I think it's funny because I know he's doing it to, like, get under my skin. Uh-huh. But it drives my husband insane because he's like, hello, father. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of has a serial killer kind of feel. You know, like, ear, ear, ear. You know, standing over you with a ball peen hammer or something. Hello, mother. That's funny. Um, But yeah, importance of names. So, Britt, let's talk a little bit about what you do. I I found you through a friend, actually through Stella's CrossFit coach, Ben, said, you've got to follow Britt on Instagram. And I think I was logged into my Lizards account Mm -hmm. at the time. And so Matthew the Lizard followed you on Instagram first. And then I couldn't figure out what your account was. So I messaged him and said, what was her, what was her account again? So you got two follows from me, but, um, sweet. Thank you. I love so many things that you posted. And, um, I just thought, you know, this would be a really great conversation around trauma because I had no idea trauma was so, and I don't know what the word is, um, maybe common Mm -hmm. or amongst us. We all have it. Yeah. And I think that's, I get a lot of pushback. I don't have trauma. I was never in a war or whatever. It's like, okay, well, trauma is not just about being a combat vet or being in a natural disaster or being assaulted. Trauma by definition is anything that's less than nurturing. That doesn't mean we're going to be. Wait a minute. Yeah. Anything that is less than nurturing is trauma. Trauma. That's one definition. That doesn't mean everything less than nurturing will traumatize us. It just means. Okay. As a kid, anything that you get that's less than nurturing can be registered by your nervous system as trauma. And that's an important distinction, I too, I think, too, is your nervous system mm-hmm. is what you're talking about. Yes. And so how is that connection? Like, your body, your body, your mind doesn't know how to deal with what just happened? Yeah, it's funny. The, you know, the guru of the field of somatic experiencing, which is what I'm certified in, um, Dr. Peter Levine, and he always says, and I love this, that trauma is not in the what happened. It's not in the event. Trauma is in the body. So you and I could experience the same car accident, for example. And for you, for whatever reason, doesn't bother you, you move on. And for me, it could be a PTSD nightmare where for years I'm having nightmares and flashbacks. And that's not about strength or weakness. That's not about you're a better woman than I am, even (laughs) though you're pretty badass. Um, It really is how our nervous system registers safety versus danger. Wow. You know, we're animals. So our brains are not wired for happiness, nor are they wired for logic. Our brains are are wired for life and death. They're wired okay, stop, for stop, survival. stop, 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 so much. <laughs> Brains not wired for happiness. No. Oh my gosh. Like, that is groundbreaking. Yes. Because, I mean, I wrote, I write about this in the book that I have coming out in December, but that happiness is not a goal. Happiness we're not entitled to. No one said it was promised, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But you just said... Our brains are not wired for happiness. Not even a little bit. And just like physical fitness, like the, all the training that you do, we have to train our brains to happy. They are not oriented towards happy. They will mm. not default to happy. We have to train ourselves. And really, happiness is a byproduct of safety. So, you know, that's why the whole let me search for happiness almost never works. Because if we don't feel safe in our bodies, we're not going to ever feel happy. So a, by- a byproduct of safety mm-hmm. um, with our bodies or our our, our environment too. I mean, it's all tied in. Exactly. Well, like right now we're in an office and you're sitting on my therapy couch. (laughs) I feel very danger in danger right now (laughs) on your therapy couch. I'm off the clock, (laughs) but logically you can look around and know, okay, you know, the walls are green and the couches are comfortable and logically I know I'm safe, but let's say as a little kid, you're sitting on a white couch right now and I'm sitting on a tan armchair. Let's say as a little kid, you got in a lot of trouble by your dad and he was sitting in a similar armchair without even thinking about it. You're, central nervous system is going to start sending distress signals Mm -hmm. down your spine to all your nerve endings. And for no quote reason, you're going to feel anxious or shaky. Um, Symptoms never come out of nowhere. There's always a reason and an origin, even if we don't know what they are. So much here. Um, Okay. So let's back up and and talk about how you came into this line of work and and kind of your, your trajectory (laughs) (laughs) as much as you'd like to share. 
Thank you. Well, I was queen of the hot mess express. Okay. I was just an absolute disaster of a human being. Masquerading is very functional. You know, I, I grew up in New York. I'm a New York Jewish girl. I went to Duke because that's what you do. And then I got my <laughs> master's because that's what you do. But I was into drugs. I was into crazy, crazy relational shit. Um, everything was just disastrous. I lived in chaos. I didn't know how to live in my body. I was kind of a floating head. And I know we had chatted uh, about yeah. that. Yeah. I'm still a floating head. It's so much safer up here. It is. So, you know, I was really, really in bad shape. And then I finally found a therapist after a bajillion who just kind of sucked. And this therapist was trained in what I'm now certified in. And I wasn't a therapist out of school. I worked in media. So, like, I worked in advertising for a but little bit. But you had a psychology background. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Psych degree, which, what do I do with a psych undergrad? Right, like an English degree. At least you didn't go to law school. <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> The other thing Jews are supposed to do. We're supposed to go to law school. But, um, you know, I had this psych degree and I'm just sort of bebopping around the country doing whatever. And I finally, you know, my eating disorder was out of control. My relationships, my relationship to food, my relationship to chemicals, everything was chaos. And then I found a therapist who understood the brain body connection and really how to work with the physiology and not just your thoughts. Cause we all know how to talk about our shit. I mean, you don't need a therapist to go out and have a conversation with a good friend. And that's right. really not good therapy. Good therapy understands that the body is connected to the brain, that our minds are inside our brains and the brain is inside the body. If you don't know a little bit about how it all works, nothing is going to be effective. So you had, and I guess we can talk about this a little bit later or as it kind of unfolds, but you said eating disorder, chemical addiction, relationship issues. So all I see is addict. Yeah. Well, and sexual abuse and childhood. And yeah, I mean, addict is a good all encompassing. How do you feel about that term? I do not like it. You do not like it. I okay. Do not why? Like it. I so do let's, not... Are we going there? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Because I always say I'm an addict. And so importance of giving myself a name and you know I've, I've talked to a lot of alcohol and I hate I hate the term alcoholic yes so I don't know if that I mean I guess it's probably the same kind of connotation but and my disclaimer is I would never tell just like I don't like being called an addict I would never tell you Meredith if you want to identify as an addict go for it like yeah do you for me, it's an identity. Like, it can be an identity. I am sure. an addict. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm Brett. You're Meredith. And because of my trauma, my nervous system defaulted to a pattern of behavior. And really, all addiction is, is a pattern of behavior that's rewarded and then repeated. Mm. And I am more than my symptoms. I am more than the things that have happened to me. And I am more than how I react to the things that have happened to me. So by saying... I'm an addict. Am I kind of leaving a door open to have an excuse for these patterns of repeated behavior <laughs> is what I heard from that. I wouldn't say that to you. I would say for me, I prefer to cultivate my identity based on a place of power and a place of I can yeah. and a place of I have. I didn't have a choice over my trauma and I didn't have a choice over becoming an addict. I did have a choice to stop being an addict. I had a choice to recover. So mm. I prefer to identify if I have to use like a psycho babble bullshit buzzword. I'm a survivor. A survivor. I'm an overcomer. Okay. Got it. Okay. And I struggled with addiction. Got it. Yeah. I think it's important though. I think those terms, and it's funny you said um, hot mess express. You said you were part of the hot mess express or on the hot Queen mess. Queen of the hot Queen mess express. Queen of the hot mess express. And I like that term. Instead of saying you were a hot mess, you were just on the hot mess express yes. train, you know, and I think that's important to, I mean, words are important. Mm -hmm. They're very important. Um, so, okay. You had some addictive behaviors. You were, um, with some traumas and that trauma, and then you found you, you had a great therapist. I did. And I had a lot of not great therapists before my great therapist. And she really, with no shame, you know, I had all these crazy behaviors and she didn't shame them. She didn't try to focus on behavior management, which all that can be useful, but really she just sat there and listened and really seeked to understand the function of the behavior. If you don't know the function of a behavior, it's, and this is the same thing with kids. If you don't understand the function of why they're doing something, you're not going to be able to really attend to the wound that's causing the behavior in the first place. So she helped me learn how to make friends with my body and listen to it and parent myself like I would if I were parenting mm. a kid. Those are important words. Tend to the wound. <laughs> oh my gosh. What if the wound is hemorrhaging? Yes. And they, what if there's multiple stab wounds? <laughs> 
And you're just bleeding out. You're just bleeding out. Uh huh. Then it's really important not to shame it. Because if you add a shame story to a symptom, yeah. it's it's never going to heal. So it's like, okay, Meredith, you're into bleh. This is what this is what your hemorrhaging out looks like. Well, okay. What, what do we do first? How do we triage this? You know, approaching it like you would in the ER. If you went to the ER with a gunshot wound, they're not going to sit there and be like, so tell me about your mother and father. And what was <laughs> it? It's like, just tend to the goddamn wound and right. we'll figure all that out later. Right. So. And they're not going to mess with the little injury either, like the broken toe. It's going to wait. Exactly. Yeah. So first things first. Do you see a lot of people that come in and they're hemorrhaging and they have these wounds and they don't even know it? I think so. Yeah. The definition of mental health that I love, and um, it's by M. Scott Peck, and it's mental health is a commitment to reality, no matter what, no matter how ugly, no matter how unpleasant, mental health is a commitment to reality. So when I'm sitting down with clients, the first order of business is how committed to reality are you? It might cost you everything. When I committed to my reality, it cost me my career. It cost me my job. It cost me my friends. It basically cost me my life. And I had to start over from, from nothing, from scratch. And that's the level of commitment. It's kind of like doing, I imagine, a triathlon, <laughs> which I've never done. But I imagine there's a level of commitment that it's a whatever it takes And people need to know that getting mentally healthy requires a level of commitment to reality that's going to suck really bad. Like, it's going to suck. I don't Pollyanna the shit. Like, mental health recovery sucks. It doesn't after a while. And then it gets awesome. But the first couple months are are brutal. I'm really glad that everything you're saying is tracking with my book. (laughs) What's the name name of your book? (laughs) It's coming out in December, and, and I'm in the middle of the final edit, and I keep thinking, this is a dog shit book. Everything sucks in this book, because I'm in that phase, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I text my editor, because when I submitted it, I'm like, this book is great, and I'm like, this book sucks, you know, but that's the writer's, like, the creative up journey. and down, yeah, uh-huh. and so it's funny, because one of the big things, and you've probably seen it on social media, is the truth onion, uh-huh. like, that you have to hold this truth onion, and you have to keep peeling, because and until, peeling, and peeling, and peeling, until you get to the stinky, putrid core, uh-huh. and, um, get your head out of the sand. I mean, reality is what it is. It is, it is there. And until you look it in the eye, you can't change anything. Exactly. And we call it in like Jungian. I'm not a Jungian trained analyst. Jungian. J-U-N-G-I-N. I know. I, that's such a hard word. Jungian. Jungian. <laughs> I just want to attribute credit. Um, and it's called shadow work. And it's really coming shadow. face to face with the most, like you said, putrid, vile, un- pleasant, just foul pieces of our self, of our soul, of our psyche. And this is not about excusing bad behavior in others. You know, ultimately we look at everything, but I could sit here and point and blame, well, this was my mom's fault and this was my dad's fault and this was his fault and this was her fault, which may be true in certain cases, but ultimately coming face to face with your own darkness is what heals people. And it's a scary journey. So, because we don't, we don't want to know. No, I'm a nice person, Meredith. I don't want to admit that and I everyone am... is shit. Everyone right? has that. We all have. <laughs> Wait, you're like, no, don't say that. <laughs> we all have a shitty part of ourselves. We all have a survivor part that's a doggy dog. I will destroy you just to. Well, I'll speak for myself. Yeah. Back in my insanity, I would have destroyed people without even a thought. I got off on it. That was power for me. Like, let me destroy you and manipulate you just to what I had. What people would call borderline personality disorder, which and is an addiction. She's making quotes. And with her fingers. With my fingers. It's not a personality disorder. It's an addiction. And I will take all the heat that I get from that because I've experienced it from the inside out. It's an addiction. Borderline personality mm-hmm. is an addiction. Yeah, we just went down a rabbit hole here. Okay, let's. we have time. Let's do a little brief rabbit hole um, because apparently that's a big controversy. Big huge controversy. So, and I can sum it up quickly. All an addiction is at its core is a pattern of behavior that's repeated as it's rewarded, despite negative consequences, despite all the shit. Personality disorders are patterns of behavior because Mm. of a shattered sense of self that are rewarded and repeated. That's it. When you treat a personality disorder like you would treat an addiction, they heal. They are not chronic, lifelong things. So the reward for treating someone like shit is power. Yeah. 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 Or attention or, you know, whatever. That's my brain emoji going through the roof. 
I have a lot of people like message me on Instagram like this is insulting to people with borderline. I'm like, girl, I have it. I had it. I have more <laughs> diagnoses after my name than I do degrees. Like yeah. bipolar, borderline. Me too. Someone declared me bipolar after one one session. Are you serious? Yeah. What was that like for you having to like be labeled like that? Well, I was like, well, great. Um, now I have a label because I love labels. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is going to make everyone very unproud of me though. You know, that, that was what I thought. But mm-hmm. I, I knew, I mean, I know I've got issues, Sure. but to just be like, here, let's medicate you. That was not every time I've been put on medication and for people that are on medication, do not go out for medication. What, you know, let's have that disclaimer. But for me to just be put on medication after a session, Wow. Yeah. And declared bipolar and have that in my health record now. Because, you know, I'll go to like a random, I have a sore throat and they're like, oh, so you're bipolar. I'm like, eh, not mm-hmm. really. But it's in there. And so people will treat you. As, and mm-hmm. I'm with you with psych. I take psych meds. I'll take psych meds for the rest of my life. I have no problem with it. I don't like calling them medicines, though. It's like if you broke your leg, you don't call the cast medicine. You know, like if I got shot in the stomach, you don't call the sutures medicine. It's a yeah. tool to help keep things where they need to be so mm-hmm. you can do what you want to do. Yeah. So yes, but medicating someone after one session and diagnosing a major quote mental illness right. is just, I'm so bummed that that happened to you. And I mean, maybe I am bipolar. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what do you think, Brent? I'm just uh, you're, well, I'm not going to say you are. You're, <laughs> what I will say is bipolar is often undiagnosed, untreated trauma because trauma yep. makes your nervous system ding, ding, ding. go like, all twacked out and it looks like bipolar. But most of the time, if you treat the trauma, the bipolar symptoms just kind of go away. Yeah. Like I'm not symptomatic. I, the DSM, which is in my corner collecting dust. Cause I hate that book. I would meet criteria. I would have met criteria for lots of things. I no longer meet criteria for any yeah, of those things. That's what it is. Meeting criteria. I meet criteria. If for. you take the test in Cosmo, you like tell you how bipolar <laughs> you're bipolar too. Here's your mood stabilizer. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're, you're not like, crazy. You're not. Cr- I love that. You say that on every post I do. or it's in your hashtag. You're not crazy. Yeah. Do people get mad that you say that? Like, no one said I was crazy. I'm not, I never thought I was crazy. People get mad, I think, because sometimes they attach to their symptoms. And that was a post I did. Like, sometimes the only connection we've ever felt is to our chaos. So for mm. asking someone to give up their depression label that they've right. worn like a coat, like, I wear my depression like a badge. It's who I am. It's how I identify. So if I don't have that, then who am I? So it's a yes. hard thing to give up. Yes. And, and same with the addict. Exactly. And I think I say I'm an addict because I, I exhibit a shit ton of addictive <laughs> behaviors. So it's like, well, if the you know shoe fits, it, it appears, um, yeah, I'm wearing it. But I don't know. I guess I do identify. Do you identify as a trauma survivor? No, because this whole thing is new for me. Uh huh. Um, for those of you listening, Britt has made me realize I have trauma. (laughs) Congratulations. Thanks a lot, Britt. But I had my first ever, uh, do we call it therapy session? Cause it's not, I mean, I guess it's therapy, not with Britt, but with another, um, what do we call you? You can call, well, you can call what you're doing. Um, like somatic coaching, somatic coaching. I had my first somatic coaching session last night and, um, yeah, I got some trauma. So congratulations for bringing that out. But it's good. I mean, the awareness, again, awareness is the first step to healing anything. It's the first step to changing anything. Mm -hmm. And for me to have made so much progress over the last decade and especially the last three years and still feel completely lost Mm -hmm. and, and going, okay, what is going on to know there's still more to uncover it, you know, it makes me want to slam my head into your pretty green wall, but, um, <laughs> I think that's important work to do. It is because I think you and I are similar and that we're very functional people, but I know that I like to leave my body and I don't use it, do it. Like I don't use meth um, to do it yes, anymore, but that's like, great. I can leave my body using work. I can leave my body using this. Like I'm not sitting in my body being present, talking to you. I'm like, there's a microphone in front of me. I'm going to float on the ceiling having this conversation. (laughs) But like, how often do you feel safe in your body? Never, Mm -hmm. never, never, never. Mm -hmm. And I was, you guys, I was telling Brett before we started, um, the guy I was talking to last night, uh, for the coaching, he had me do like a mindfulness where he wanted me to notice how I felt with like from my toes to my knees. And I was like crawling out of my skin and it made me realize 
just how much I don't like to feel in my body. Mm-hmm. And that, that blew my mind. Because I've always felt that way, but again, not knowing, not right. being aware that I'm crawling out of my skin. Um, and I don't know if that's good or bad. I know it's good because it's it's teaching me something that I didn't know. Right. Well, what would it be like for you if you did feel safe and comfortable in your body? Like, what would change the in your world life? should probably watch out, right? <laughs> I mean, because if yeah, I, I mean, mean, look how you're doing not living in your body. Like, if you're ki- like killing it and kicking ass, <laughs> not being here, what's going to be what? How much more are you going to be capable of? Capable of once you're living in the body that you're walking around on. The okay, so let's back up. What does living in the body actually mean? Yeah, that's a really, really big. I'm floating floating around my microphone too right now. You know, you could call it just feeling embodied, you know, like I, I know how to feel comfortable. I know how to relax. I know how to go up and be excited. I know how to come down and be relaxed and all elements of the emotional spectrum are available to me. I think that's the Mm. best way to describe it. Like I run pretty hard. It's hard for me to chill and down regulate and relax. Often I feel like my car is stuck with the gas on and I can't find the brakes to pump them. So living in your body means you're driving a car where the brakes don't squeak and the gas doesn't stick to the floor and you can have a smooth ride. How's that? That seems impossible. (laughs) (laughs) That seems like garbage. I mean, really, I was thinking, and I think this goes back to my issues with eating, Mm -hmm. my weight, my size, how every time I sit down, I'm immediately drawn to, okay, is my stomach rolling over my pants? And Mm -hmm. why is my back fat popping out and hitting your wall? Like right now I'm like, why is this bra (laughs) making this back fat come out and hit the wall? I mean, I'm five feet from your wall. You know what I mean? But that's, that is what Mm -hmm. I experience in my body constantly. Right. And I've noticed recently it's, I'm aware of when I don't have those thoughts because I'm like, I just went 10 minutes without hating my body. Yeah. It's a, and you know, people, I get a lot of pushback on this too, but, not, and the pushback that I get is that, well, eating disorders are about society and being fat or thin and it's about control and that's all part of it. And I've had every eating disorder that there is like all of the ones in the DSM I've had like overeating, undereating, restricting, purging, all of them. Eating disorders are not about those things. Those things are what we use in order to avoid our bodies because eating disorders are about our right to take up space on the planet, right? The more you eat, the more you gain weight, you're literally existing more on the planet. So if I bring, if I gain 20 pounds, there's now 20 more pounds of me that exist on the planet. And that's a hard one. If you've been taught or either directly or indirectly that you don't matter and you're inadequate and you don't have the right to exist. So what a lot of people will do is they will restrict in an effort to shrink themselves down to not take up space on the planet or they'll overeat and take up more than what's theirs to take because it feels safer. And, and that's me. I, I identified that several years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always felt so, and this is sounds weird, but I've always felt sorry for women that could be picked up and carried somewhere. Mm. I, and I've, I've had that sensation from a young age. Like I don't want any man to walk up behind me, pick me up and carry me somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think I, deep down, I have purposely made myself heavy. And I mean, if my husband comes up and tries to pick me up, he laughs because I put both feet on the ground and make myself heavier. He's like, stop making yourself heavier. I'm like, don't pick me up. Like, I don't want to be picked up. It doesn't feel safe. No, yeah. I don't. And I won't ride a motorcycle for that reason. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be at any. And, and so, yeah, I think, and that's a really big push and pull, right? Because I am I want to be smaller because I want to feel better in my skin. I want to run faster. I mm-hmm. want to feel more attractive. But at the same time, I have a core belief that I need to be heavier so I'm safe. Right. And our nervous systems will reinforce that. So if I get too small and that's my belief that small means danger because someone could pick me up and take me away. As soon as I lose weight, I'm going to start having panic attacks and I'm going to have anxiety and I won't know why. Or sabotage. Like I'm in. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think, and we don't have to go into me personally, but as a child, I was very much raised to be skeptical and pretty much fearful of all strangers. Stranger mm-hmm. danger was huge. Like mm-hmm. if you see a van, don't walk behind Run. it. If I see a freaking van now, I freak out. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm terrified in like the candy van, right? <laughs> Free candy. <laughs> and it's like a murder van. Yeah. The murder van. Right. The murder van. And, um, 
but I was, I lived my life terrified that someone was going to take me. Mm -hmm. And I know my parents were trying to instill in me the safety and and all that, but they literally made me terrified that I was going to be snatched all the time. Right. And I'm so glad you said that Meredith, because their intention may not have been bad. Right. This is true with trauma. Trauma does not care whether your intention was good or bad, regardless of your parents' intention. It's the impacts that their choice had on you. So I really like to separate out a person's intention from the impact. Well, they didn't mean to hurt me. Well, right. that's great, but like they may not have meant to run you over, but your leg's broken, so you still have to <laughs> fix it. Right. And so they may not have meant to scare the crap out of you and put you in a perpetual state of fight or flight, but they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I think back to my early childhood emotions, fear... Mm-hmm. And it was, it was just a, a kind of a cloud of fear. Mm-hmm. I was scared of not having enough to eat <laughs> for my little chubby body. Mm-hmm. I was always hungry. I was scared of not having enough to eat. I was scared of getting snatched by the murder vans. There was a lot of murder vans then though, too. Yes. Cause that was the, like, that's the thing. That was the thing. Um, yeah, I was, I was scared a lot mm-hmm. and not because necessarily of anything directly in the house or whatever, but made to fear everything. And that's less than nurturing. That was less, I mean, food issues and eating disorders are all about nurture needs, feeling safe and nurtured. And so anytime there's an eating issue or a weight issue or a food issue, there's a safety thing there and a nurture thing there. You said something on Instagram that that's the mother wound. I was like, what is the mother wound? Okay. So, and yeah, this one was a disgusting puke fest when I learned about the mother wound. It's like, well, my mom didn't mean to fuck me up, but okay, she may not have meant to, but she still did. So the very first act of bonding that's supposed to happen between an infant and mom is feeding, right? That is what's first. That is the very first thing that happens when we pop out onto the planet. And that sets us up, you know, and again, you know. Some... Okay, so let me tell you, uh-huh. I was not only not breastfed, but my dad fed me my first bottle. <laughs> Is that the problem? Me too. Me too. And again, no shame, no blame. Right. Like some moms can't breastfeed right. or whatever. Like this is not about blaming. This is just about understanding the origins of wounds for the sake of healing it. Okay. Right. So my dad too. That's so funny though. And mom, I'm not blaming you. We're just discussing. Don't get mad. I don't need a text. I love you. Um, <laughs> but that's funny though. Like when I, and, and there's such pride in my parents uh-huh. of my dad feeding me my first bottle. That's the mythology that. in your family. Yeah. Which is, that's great. Yay, dad. But it's supposed to be, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm making a pukey face too. (laughs) It's supposed to be the mother and the child. And the mother's relationship with food is what's modeled for us. So, like, I'll speak culturally as a Long Island Jew. Like, we're taught such mixed messages about food. It's don't eat, be as skinny as you can because you'll only get married if you're skinny enough. And then, oh, you're sad? Here, eat something. (laughs) So, and then it's once you start eating something because you're sad, it's are you sure you want to eat that? You know, you really (laughs) need to be skinny. It's classified. And so, you know, it's supposed to be the act of feeding is the first sacred thing. And then the next thing is mom models how to nurture ourselves through our use of food. And if that's not modeled, then we have a mother wound and we have to learn to reparent ourselves by literally learning how to feed ourselves yeah. compassionately, lovingly, and skillfully. Love. Well, it was, <laughs> it was interesting when I talked to Lauren Zander a couple of podcasts back, she, I mentioned that my mom was always really thin and tall mm-hmm. and... And then there was me. I was like this wart. I always felt like I was this like wart that she carried around because I was this bald kid until I was three. I didn't have hair till three. I looked awful. But I look at pictures of me and my mom and I'm like, God, this ugly little kid. She had to drag around because she was 112 pounds. Okay. Like, was, Are you hearing what you're saying? Yeah, it's terrible. Ah! It's terrible. I know. But when I said to Lauren Zander, I was like, my mom never struggled with her weight. She was like, you don't know that. Mm -hmm. But when I think about my mom and food, I have no memory. That's amazing, right? Of her eating. I have, I'm Mm -hmm. sure she ate, but I don't have any memory of when she ate. I don't remember really seeing her eat until recent years. I know she did, Mm -hmm. right? I mean. She must have eaten something. She must have. And, um, but I don't, I think the struggle I have with it is how we've never had a conversation about her relationship with food. Mm-hmm. Like, did she really work hard to be that thin? Cause I've always been under the impression she just was. And that wasn't fair. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so my whole perception of, from a very young age, what was taught to you about being a, a woman in a body and food Were you taught don't eat junk food because you'll get fat. I, I remember that we didn't talk about 
my body mm-hmm. until, well, I think the inappropriate, I had inappropriate conversations about my body mm-hmm. and, um, it, it was never, puberty was like never discussed like, Hey, you're going to get bigger. And, and, and I noticed when I got put on a diet, I got put on Weight Watchers at 10 or 11. Me too. And the grapefruit diet. And the grapefruit with my grandmother, who was just a wonderful person. But um, she, we, we would go to Weight Watchers. We would gain three pounds and go eat pizza just this once and start tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I love her dearly for that. But, um, you know, I was put on a diet at the age my daughter is now. And puberty was around the corner. Mm-hmm. Literally, I probably would have shot up two inches and it would have been, it would have been fine. fine. You know, so... There was definitely a feeling of desperation, I think, with my parents. Like, oh, gosh, she's fat. What do we do with her? Right. Because kids weren't really fat. Right. Back then. Like, now you, you know, can throw a rock at a fat kid. <laughs> Does that sound terrible? Oh, you shouldn't throw rocks at children, and that's bad to say. PSA, don't throw, don't throw rocks at kids. PSA, don't throw rocks at children or at puppies. But... You know, I was a chunky kid, mm-hmm. and they and I think there was a feeling of helplessness. What do we do with her? Which assumes, and I had the same experience, because I was overweight as a kiddo and then restricted as an adult, but there's this, what's wrong with her? And that's the right. message that we got as kids. I was hungry. Mm-hmm. That's what's wrong with me. When I look back, I remember being so hungry. What were you hungry for? Now we're getting into I was therapy. hungry for real food, mm-hmm. because I was restricted on my lunches. Hmm. Um, I was not fed. And so I would come home and, and gorge right. because I was genuinely hungry. Right. You weren't nurtured. I was, cause yeah. I was, you know, and it, it fed the cycle. Cause like I look at my third grade picture and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I was just round. I was a big circle. Um, but I remember being very hungry in third grade. And when I think about the health, what I know now, well, I, I probably had pop tarts for breakfast mm-hmm. and then I had cottage cheese and carrots and maybe a half a sandwich for lunch. Well, then by the time I got home, I was starving, so I binge. And, and that's why I gained weight. You know, I look look back on the cycle. It's awful. I mean, the best diet advice I've ever heard was eat real food and eat when you're hungry. And that's, I mean, the mental health field could put the diet industry out of business in five seconds. Because really, when you're in, like we were talking about before, when you're comfortable in your body, you can listen to it. So you know when you're hungry, you know what you're hungry for, you know how to say when, and then there's an off switch. And mm-hmm. so you know when you're embodied, okay, I'm going to have ice cream. I'm not going to have a whole story attached to it. I'm not going to eat all of the cake, but I'm also not going to eat none of the cake mm. because I know as a person in my body, I can listen to it and tend to it in a way that makes sense. I have such a hard time parenting a daughter. I mean, and she's built like I was, and I try not to project that on her. Oh, so it's gotta be she will not, she'll be 20 before she'll hear this, but <laughs> Um, and then in her own therapy session, with, <laughs> my mother told all of my stuff on a podcast. Do you remember podcasts? That's all me all sleep by then. Um, but I, I struggle because she's so much like I Does that trigger? Was, and it triggers mm. and, and I'm, and she's hungry and I'm like, okay, you can eat anything that's green or grown on a bush. Go have it. Mm-hmm. And so I try to put parameters around what to I eat. I love that. And I don't know if that's right, but you know, I'm like... It, don't go eat out of the pantry, go eat out of the fridge. Mm-hmm. Or... Well, you're teaching her how to eat real food. Right. I think I ate a vegetable until I was like 23. <laughs> but then I get mad. Mm-hmm. Like then I see, I see my reflection of myself in her, right? When she's like, I'm hungry. And I'm like, you just freaking ate. Mm. And I want it, like everything in me just cringes. And I'm like, you've had enough to eat, you know? And I'm like, don't say, Mur! you know, I'm like bite my hand yeah. before I say a word. But that past and you you learn how to parent from your parents absolutely and i remember i I was always told you can't you're you're not hungry i'm like well i am hungry i mean i'm hungry right now i just ate on the way over here i'm always hungry i am too (laughs) and what i wish and first of all you're an amazing mom for even questioning and being aware that you're triggered like my parents don't believe in therapy which is like (laughs) i think your whole job is just bullshit they think it's for other people right we're fine it's them but um the fact that you're even questioning your parenting makes you like i tell the parents of the kids i work with the goal is not to not fuck your kids up like you're gonna fuck them up because that's just life it's how do you respond to them and are you willing to course correct and look Mm -hmm. at reality 
which you are. I wish my mother had said to me back after I would eat, you know, six donuts and I was still hungry to actually ask me, all right, what are you, what are you actually feeling in your body? Is it in your tummy? Is it in your chest? You know, or what are your emotions right now? Are you feeling sad or scared? And it's okay to ask that. Yeah. To say, why do you think you're hungry? Like, or uh, to say what you're feeling. No. Why are you hungry? Cause frankly, she doesn't know. Like half of the adults I work with don't know right. why they feel what they feel, but teaching her like, so what's your arm feel like right now? What does your leg feel like right now? What does your body want to do right now? Does it want to get really small and curl up? Does it want to get really big and move? I just hit the tree, sorry. (laughs) Does it want to get really big and move around? And a lot of times doing this kind of embodied movement puts not just kids, but puts people back in where they're like, oh, wait, no, I'm not hungry. I'm pissed off right now. Like I am angry right now. Mm -hmm. Or no, I'm not hungry. I'm tired. Or the 12-step community actually gets this right. I don't agree with everything in the 12-step community, but they do a lot well. And the halts, you know, before you think about using, check in to see if you're hungry, angry, angry, lonely, or tired. And so teaching kids how to do that, too. Well, let's go through all the emotions, you know? Yeah. What are you feeling emotionally? I don't know. I'm just hungry. That's a sign to me that there's another thing going okay. on. Oh, that's really interesting. And when you said that actually makes me realize when I binge eat, Mm -hmm. I am angry. Always I do it out of anger. And I didn't realize that until you just said that. And it probably goes back to the idea I'm trying to make myself bigger and more Mm -hmm. powerful, right? So I need Mm -hmm. to get some fuel so I can go kill some people. (laughs) Yes. Well, from the nervous system, like survival physiology lens, it's really, if we're talking fight, flight, and freeze, binge eating is kind of a fight. I mean, it could be any of them. But for me, and it sounds like for you, it's a fight response. It's like, I'm getting, getting, like, I need six bowls of cereal uh-huh. right now because I'm about to go to battle. <laughs> I'm carving up for battle. Yes. Exactly. And all that wow. fight energy circulates through your body in your physiology. And if it's not expressed and worked through, it just recycles. Oh, yes. and that's why binging becomes um, repetitive, habitual, and its own kind of addiction because we get addicted to our own hormones that we produce from our behaviors. Mm-hmm. Blowing my mind. Brar. Okay. So we talked about the mother wound. Blech. Yeah. Um, for those of you listening, that's the barf sound. <laughs> it's not a goat. <laughs> um, what else should we... There's so much we can go from here. We've talked about food. Um, you want to talk about fitness from a place of self-love versus fitness from a place of self-hate? Yeah. Okay. Because, yeah. you know, you're an athlete. And- I started fitness because... Of, uh, I started fitness for self-hate. Okay. How did you... Because I know you do it from a place of self-love. Like, you're in... Um- no. Sometimes? You know, I, I'd like to say I've come to a place of self-love, but I think if we're calling bullshit. Okay. I, I so respect you. I don't, I can't say I love myself. Yes. Yet. Yes. No. I tolerate myself, which is better because I used to not be able to tolerate myself, which is why I drunk, drank myself into a stupor. Uh-huh. And which is why I, I you know, ate myself so to, to a body so big, no one would love me. Mm-hmm. You know. I respect your honesty. <laughs> I respect the throwdown. Okay. So for you then, what would it look like to train and do all of the things, these amazing superhero feats that you do? What would it look like to train from a place of self-love versus self-hate for you? I think I'm getting there. Okay. So maybe I'm not giving a completely fair assessment. I, I got up this morning and really had to hustle to get my chest workout in and my cardio before I came here. Mm -hmm. And I did that not because I wanted to shrink myself. I did that because I knew it will make me feel powerful. Yes. <laughs> and that's a thing though, but that's me being an eight on the Enneagram, right? <laughs> like wanting to make myself huge and powerful. Um, but I did that from a place of growth. Yeah. I guess. Which so, is good. Yeah. You know, the, the things that I do for fitness, sometimes I end up with bruises or scrapes or whatever. And as an assault survivor, this time when I have the bruises and the scrapes, it's not because I have submitted to someone in a greater position of power over me. It's because I'm trying to do things that challenge me and push me and I celebrate it. It's like, hey, yeah. look, I've got bruises and bumps and scrapes and my muscles are getting stronger and I'm sore as shit. And I celebrate that because it means I'm moving forward versus I'm repeating the past. Well, and that's interesting because I came to fitness through swim, bike and run through triathlon, which is very much a um, perceived thin person sport, Mm -hmm. right? It's very much the smaller you are, the quicker you'll be, the faster, easier it is to swim, bike and run. Um, So I think I came to triathlon with that desire Mm -hmm. for that sport to shrink me because I was taking up a lot of space. And then I got into it and I realized nothing was going to shrink me if I didn't 
I mean, I don't know that anything's going to shrink me. And I, and I think I'm coming to the place that that's finally okay, that maybe I need to be this size to feel safe, mm-hmm. but it's a healthy size. Like I'm a nice strapping 194 pounds. You You're awesome. I mean? You are a badass. <laughs> You're not picking my ass up and I'm healthy. Right. So, um, the affirmation I use for that, like for clients who were, this is the conversation before you go into the gym or before you go to eat a meal, this sounds cheesy, but it, like uh, affirmations work. They just do. Mm-hmm. I have the right to exist. I have the right to exist in this body as I am. You know, I have the right to exist and take up space on this planet. I'm going to take up all the space that's mine to take up. I'm not going to take up more because that's not going to feel good. And I'm not going to take up less because that's not going to feel good. But I have the right to exist. And I'm going to train as if I have the right to exist. And I'm going to feed myself as if I have the right to exist. I'm going to sleep as if I have the right to exist. It just changes the mind frame. We're doing the same things, but from a different frame of mind. It's fantastic when it switches like that. I don't do it all the time. I don't get this perfectly, (laughs) but it's a hell of a lot easier than it used to be. Where did we get the message that we don't have the right to exist or take up space? Mm -hmm. Just as kids, like being seen and not heard and yeah. I mean, what are all the, you know, kids should be seen and not heard, right? Listen to your mother. Do as I say, not as I do. Everything about how our society raises children tells the kids, you have no voice. You have no power. We're the grownups. We're in charge. Hug your grandma. Be oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Hug the creepy uncle. Uh-huh. I don't really have a creepy uncle, but... Everyone has a creepy somebody. Yeah. I think it's it's starting to switch. But I, I love nothing more when I see a parent not make the kid hug whoever. Like, you don't have to hug grandma if you don't want to. Well, that's that, hard. It's though. so hard. That's I know. hard because, um, yeah. Because then grandma gets all butthurt. And then they think you parent badly. Right. And I'm like, they just don't want to sit in your lap. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Pukey face. They just. But that's how we learn whose be. body is this. Is it my body or is it, you know, grandma's body or is it creepy uncle's, mm. Uncle Bill's body or is creepy it. Creepy Uncle Bill. Ugh. Right? Yeah. So it is tricky because then you have expectations and you have the guilt trips. And... Yeah, I saw some article in the, on Facebook years ago about why you should not make your children mm-hmm. hug or kiss anyone they don't want to. Mm-hmm. It's true. They're body boundaries. And you can't separate body boundaries from food is all about our bodies and how we attend to and how we take care of our bodies. So for kids, teaching them, here's where you exist, here's where someone else exists, and you don't have to let them into your space if you don't want to. It's a, it's a tough one. And if we're not given permission to do that, we have no idea how to parent or coach or teach other people how to I do I mean, this. growing up in the South, you had no body boundaries. No! <laughs> Same thing growing up in New York. Wow. Everyone's in your space all the time. That's just crazy to me. Like, I, I mean... And no shame. Like, you know, like, if you've made your kids hug someone, like, no shame. Like, when we know better, we do better. Like, you only can do what you know. So I'm really big on not shaming ourselves sure. for doing things less than ideally. Well, and, and that's... I think that's a really important point because I have done so many things in the last 20 years, especially as a drinker, um, that I, A, don't remember. <laughs> Who knows what I've done? Thank God a. for blackouts. Thank God for blackouts. They're there for a reason. I always joke that I knew... I did something bad when I brushed my teeth in the morning. We had dueling sinks, me and my husband, and I'd look at him, and he would be so angry. And I would have, I'd just be brushing my teeth like, it's another, you know, hungover day. And he's looking at me like he could kill me. And I'm like, holy crap, what did I do? I did it last night. What did I do? You know, but I just can't think about the regrets. I can't think about the past. Like, where does therapy overlap in trauma with our past? Because do we have to relive? No, the I'm so glad you said that because I totally forgot to make a note to say that. So yeah. thank you because a lot of people don't want to do therapy because they don't want to rehash the past because they already lived it once. Right. And it's actually, it's re-traumatizing to relive your past. So one thing I never do as a therapist is you will never, ever hear me say, tell me about your childhood because the pa- knowing the past and reliving it is not necessary to heal it. Mm. So, you so know, knowing the past, is, you don't you right, even say that again. Say yeah. that again. So going back, so I'll say it two ways. Reliving your past is not necessary to heal it. Okay. Even knowing what the hell happened to you in your past is also not necessary to heal it. So the type of therapy that I do, which is somatic kind of nervous system based therapy, is we heal our wounds from the past by how things show up in the present. So I have clients with whom I've worked with for years and we've never gone through and at three this happened and at five this happened because talking about your stuff does not heal your stuff. But you have to know something happened. 
You have to start with, if you have a symptom like here in April of 2019, if all of a sudden you're having panic attacks and you can't settle and your relationships are a mess, there's only two options. One, you're crazy or two, something bad happens. <laughs> and you're not crazy. And you're not crazy. And by and large, they've even done this research with schizophrenics that pretty much universally schizophrenics have a family system where there was untreated trauma. So it's again, it's not about blame. It's about start with the assumption that I may not know what the hell happens, but clearly something happens. I'm going to have compassion on myself. I'm going to honor my truth, even if I don't know the specifics of what it is. And I'm going to work from that place. I'm taking notes because I think my chapter two has a section that says understanding what the hell happened. <laughs> you yes. just said we don't have to know what the hell happened. You really something don't. Because yeah. if you think about it, we don't even have cognitive memories right. until we but have... But you know something was there and something it wasn't... Something happens. Something made you whatever. Right. You never need to know what happens. Ever. Like, I'll never have memories from before the age of three because... You can't. You don't have the brain structure to have memories before the age of three. But I know bad shit happened at that age. So Because <laughs> they call it the terrible tooth for a reason. Right. And God, you can't remember it, right? I think it's the, the mercy of our brain chemistry that you mm. can't. But knowing what happened is not necessary to heal it. And people who say, well, you can't change the past. What's the point in doing therapy? Well, you can't change the past, but you can change everything about how your brain responds in the present to the things that happened from the past. And it's all working with the body. Wow. I mean, one of, when my son was three, um, my kids are 14 months apart. Oh God. So James was Bless 10. your heart. <laughs> Bless my heart. <laughs> so James got all the attention for all of mm -hmm. 14 months of his life mm -hmm. before his sister came into the world. And then... Strangely, he developed tantrums. There you go. Like it doesn't mean you did anything wrong by having another kid. But he But for him he did he was like, Wait a minute, where's my mother? Oh she you know. And so we actually went to play therapy and I forget interactive child interactive Oh parent child interactive therapy. We, we did that with him. Oh, you're such a good mom. And because I was like, I don't know what to do. He would have 45 minute tantrums mm -hmm. and I never forget. But I sat with three year old James in her office and she goes, there's nothing wrong with your son. It's you. <laughs> and I was like, you can die. But she goes, wow. you don't know how to parent. Wow. That's so harsh. And it was harsh. And I was, and then she, and, I mean, maybe it wasn't quite that harsh. That's what I heard. Um, <laughs> but she said, typically behavior that James is exhibiting comes from having a depressed mother. Wow. Ouch. And I was like, uh, you know, what do you mean? I can't wait to get out of here and drink. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that was what was going through my head. Yeah. But that moment made me realize what I am doing in parenting James is going to have a lasting lifelong impact mm. on this child. Like in that moment, I was like, I'm. You know, but it wasn't because I didn't want to be a good mother. Sure. I just was unskillful. Well, you and weren't I parented. Loved that word. Yeah. And, and so I learned how to talk to my son. Yeah. And I was not speaking to him like a three-year-old should be spoken to. I was speaking mm -hmm. to him like, you know, your military brother you would speak to on the war, right. you know, on the combat field or whatever. And that was like kind of the first turn of awareness wow. that I didn't know how to be a mother. I really didn't. What changed after that therapy? Um, just the way I communicated with my kids. And did you see him respond differently to yes. you? Yes. Well, we, he was a tough, he was a tough nut to crack. I mean, <laughs> we had to do timeout room and all that mm -hmm. because he, everything he would, every time I would ask him to do something, the answer was no. Mm -hmm. And so you, I'm sure you know about that therapy. You immediately have a, you say, if you don't do this, then there's a consequence. Love and logic. And he was like, he didn't care. I mean, we, you know, so he had to go to the timeout room, but he knew what the timeout room was. He knew the consequence and that was the whole thing. But it was also, I spoke to him day to day in commands. Mm. I, everything was look, listen, stop, do. And, and I realized that's how I was spoken to mm -hmm. as a child. It was always a command. Right. Look at the sky. That is a command. Yeah. Do it. You yeah. know, look. And, and, um, it would be, cause she would watch it. Oh, it's humiliating. You know, watching a oh, therapist God, have know. you talk to your kid, just the words I chose. It was almost like she had a buzzer, <clears throat> but it was great. You're amazing for doing that because like as little kids, it's magic what happens when they're listened to and seen and heard. And yes. it doesn't take a whole lot. No. And I notice even now he's, uh, James is 11. He's a wonderful kid. Mm. I mean, truly, everyone says that, but he is, he is a hard, just a huge heart. 
And all he wants is me to stop what I'm doing and look at him yeah. when he comes up to me. Yeah. Because I'll be on my computer, da, 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 mm-hmm. typing, 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 and he'll come up to me and he'll hug me. And I can keep hugging and go, I love you, pat, pat. But when I put my hands down, mm-hmm. turn, stop, hug, that's what, and that's what I didn't do when he was two. Wow. One, because wow. I had his sister and I had my law job and I had, I just was busy. Mm-hmm. And I didn't And you didn't realize, know. No. You didn't know that your little, you know, his little nervous system right. needed yours to co-regulate. You know, he needed your, literally right. your body to help him settle Correct. and relax. So I guess all wow. of that to say, he's 11. I'm trying to be a conscious parent. What can I do as a parent of an 11 year old going into teenagers? And, and for anyone listening with, mm-hmm. you know, older kids, if we failed to nurture like we should have as right. parents and we desperately want to now, what do we do? Yeah. And you are doing all the things you're supposed to do. And I'll say this too, you know, I tell all the parents I work with, I'm not a, a parent coach. I would never presume to tell you what to do. I'm a kid interpreter. Like I know how to speak kid. So I'll tell you what your teen or what your kid is actually saying and then parent however you want. Uh-huh. But all often for teens, what teens are saying is just let me exist in this space. Cause you know, we try to have conversations with teens, right? Why don't they listen? And nothing gets through. It's cause their brains are on fire. And for a teenager, something as simple as, Hey, why don't you take me through your Instagram and show me some pictures of your friends and just tell me who they all are. That is a magical intervention really? for parents of teens. Don't try to give them advice. Don't try to tell them what to do. If they're complaining about something that as a parent, you think is stupid, like it might be, but to them, it's a big deal. So rather than try to fix it, just listen. Wow, that sounds really hard. Tell me more. Wow, I imagine you must be super frustrated. I can see that. Even if you don't agree or even if you think it's silly, just being present. You know, if they're listening. And recognizing their feelings. Yeah, validation. Validating. Yeah, that's the word I was Yeah, like, Meredith, right now, you, not right now, but if you were my teen, (laughs) Meredith, you seem really angry. Oh, no, that's that's pretty much right now. Meredith, you seem angry. (laughs) But instead of asking them why questions, yes, no one likes to be asked wh- why automatically implies you're doing something wrong. Why are you doing that? Why do you feel that? Why are you saying that? Just, hey, I noticed you seem really angry. I'm available if you want to talk. Mm. That is powerful. That tells your teenager, you don't have to talk to me. I'm not commanding you to talk to me. I'm seeing you. I'm seeing that you're hurting and I'm available if you want to connect. What do you think about parenting from a standpoint of treating them like, they're real people instead of just children, (laughs) you know, like apologizing when I mess up and I know it, I go to them and I deeply heartfelt apologize. And I don't know if that's like a parenting fail. No. Oh my God. No, no. You're modeling how to be a human. Right. For parent, because I grew up with parents that were titans. They were bigger than the gods. Right. Like, you don't question their authority. Right. And so, of course, I grew up having a fear of authority, people pleasing, perfectionism, all of the things. As a parent, for you to say to your kiddo, hey, you know what, buddy? I did that wrong. And here's how I think that my mistake, you probably felt really sad when I said that. And I just want you to know that that was wrong of me to say. And in the future, I'll make sure that, you know, I'm not trying to do six things at once when you come to me. Is there anything that you need me to hear about what that was like? Like, yeah. holy shit. If people parented like that, I would be out of a job and that would be great. <laughs> right? Not just parenting, but even in relationships, you know, modeling being a human and it's imperfect and it's messy and it's complicated. But what a better gift to give a kid than to show them skillfully and in an age appropriate way. Right. Your humanity. Well, I, um, James and I got a little crossways a couple of weeks ago. I just, he was shutting down on me. Mm. Like I could just tell he was just, yeah, the walls, the, went up. the walls went up, blinds went up and he was not having any communication with me. And I, I just wrote him a letter <laughs> I love and that. I stuck it on his, um, on his sink. And I, I, and it was probably too much, but I just felt in the, that my heart needed to tell him that I was sorry. I wasn't as good of a mother when he was a baby as I wanted to be. Mm. And I, and I feel like it was, but he's a very smart and mature right. and you child. Know your kid, you're the expert on your kid. And you know what he can manage. Yeah. And so I did, I told him, I said, I wish I could go back and just, you know, put you in the baby carrier <laughs> and carry you around. And, and it was just, I tried to be very heartfelt mm-hmm. that I wish I would have been better, but oh. I'm trying so hard to be, you know what he needs and, and that if I'm, I'm here, if you need me. And this is basically wow. what I said. And we didn't talk about it. I know he saw it, 
but he asked me like a couple days because he's a five. <laughs> and so he, he has a marinade on it. And um, for those of you who would wonder what my numbers are, I'm reading about the Enneagram. And so you number of personality anyway, but um, he had to marinate on it for like four days, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but he came to me and he's like, do you mind if we talk this evening? Your 11 year old son? My 11 year old son. Wow. And so we, he, or he said, can we have a private talk? <laughs> I was like, oh, don't say the word private, but, but sure. And so we did that. And he didn't want to talk about anything important. He just wanted, I mean, it was important to him. Right. But nothing right. like. Nothing heavy. No, he, but he connected. He, he received that. He received it. And, and you know he did because he reached back out to right. you to connect. Oh my God, that's like, that gives me the chills. And so I'm like, oh God, did I, you know, did I do too much? But I just, God, I just desperately want them to not suffer. Yeah. And, and I know they've got to suffer. Right. But I want them to not suffer the way I have. Mm-hmm. And, and not out of fear. Like, oh, I don't want you to have this terrible life. Right. Um, you want them to feel loved and seen. Genuine, yeah. So what are words we can say? Like, I know we have to show action. Mm-hmm. But what do we tell our kids, our students, if you don't have kids, um, or whoever. a kid at the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Like, what do we say to this next generation that maybe they won't be as kind of traumatized or lost as we might be? Yeah, I like to tell people, and this is true with parenting, coaching, kids, and again, just relating to other humans of the same age group. Instead of using I or me or my statements, switch those to you and yours and really switch the, well, I think this, well, I think you should do this. Taking the word should out of our vocabulary Mm. is a good start. But instead of to a kid, you know, I really think that you should have worked harder on that test. It's like, hey, you seem really sad about failing that test. I imagine you must feel a lot of shame right now. You, you really mirror, because kids really What if they say no, but now I do? (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, mom. <laughs> and if he's just like, no, you're crazy. Oh, okay. So you're not feeling sad. Okay. So I wonder if you're feeling angry. No, I'm fine. Oh, okay. You're feeling fine. So, all right, buddy. I'm guessing that you're feeling uncomfortable and you don't really want to talk about all this. So, okay. So we don't have to talk, but really naming what you think they're experiencing. Because if you're wrong, they'll tell you. Mm. I think you're sad. No, I'm not sad. I'm pissed off. Okay. So you're pissed. But the power of tracking and mirroring language, here's what I'm seeing from you is really settling to the central nervous system. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Meredith, I see that you're taking that in. And you're leaning <laughs> I see back. that you're taking that in. The light bulb. Your, <laughs> your head is attached to your body. For and you're leaning back. I mean, in play therapy, not the kind, the interaction therapy that you did, but in t- typical play therapy, we literally follow the kids around. Now you're picking up the ball. Yes. No, we did that too. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is garbage. Oh, I, I see. I don't know if I was allowed to say I see. No. And now you're picking up the blocks. Uh-huh. And now you're, I was like, this is going to be the death of me. Did it work? Yeah. Yeah. It's but such it's an about recognizing what they're doing. They're mm-hmm. existing, right? And you're recognizing. And just validating it. Oh, look, you've decided to go into Except the Except don't dogs. say look. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Yeah. Fail. Now you're going into the dollhouse. Right. And now you're choosing to pick up that doll. And now you're choosing to put the doll down. Now you threw the doll against the wall. And now you're going over to the play You're stabbing mommy. Like, exactly. <laughs> without judgment. There's without some judgment. really crazy shit that you see in play therapy. Yeah. You know? And you just name it. It's powerful work to just see someone and name what they're doing mm-hmm. without trying to change them or change it's it's it gives a message to them that i am accepted i am seen and i have the right to exist well and i think knowing what i know about james as a as a young child and knowing the wonderful heart he has as an 11 year old the tendency for parents to want to discipline over strong hand you know strong handedly mm-hmm. or you have a delinquent child or right. this child needs to get beat because right. it is a feral child It's not true. No. And I'm all about consequences. I do. I mean, actually, if kids don't have consequences or limits, they they suffer. They suffer. Right. Think about a parent enabling a drug drug addict, you know, like without limits and consequences, we're going to suffer pretty intensely. But disciplining a child from a place of compassion and not a place of rage, right, as a parent as the adult in charge my job is to regulate myself recognize that this little kid is not trying to fuck my reality they're just (laughs) like doing their thing okay buddy so if you choose this you're choosing this consequence and then if he chooses the consequence don't get mad just set the consequence okay well you chose this which means you're choosing to have this consequence 
That's a bummer. So, you know, next time I'm going to try to help you make better choices. Right. But Taking recognizing that they're doing it for a reason. Yes. And just like we do our shitty behavior for yes. a reason. Understanding the function of any behavior is necessary to heal it or transform it or change it. What did we not cover? Because I, I, We didn't talk about sex, which is fine. We talked about eating. We can talk ones. about sex. You want to talk about sex and then we'll close? Okay. <laughs> it's an odd transition from child, child to sex. There's but... been a big pause and it's been an appropriate time in between. Now we're <laughs> moving toward... <laughs> Well, we can talk. Did we cover exercise? I think we covered the taking up space. The taking up space and exercising from a place of love and not a place of punishment. I was so bad the other day. Mm -hmm. I ate cake. Now I need to. No, you're never. The I am bad. Sorry, this is my last rant on food. You're never bad when you eat shit. Like, it's really important that we change that language. I yeah. would, I'm not good when I eat carrots, and I'm not bad when I eat cupcakes. It's these are my choices, and some are healthy, some are less than healthy, but I'm always good. Like, Meredith, you are always good even when you're abusing the fuck out of yourself. I'm always good <laughs> even when I'm abusing the fuck. When I'm smoking meth and not eating for five days and doing crazy shit, I'm still good. I'm not bad. And so taking the shaming language off of the food relationship is really useful in healing the relationship. And eyes on your own plate, right? Uh-huh. Stop it's, commenting on what people are eating. Whether you think that they're too thin. You know, the whole, like, she's not thin, eat a cheeseburger. Like, that's really abusive to people. And so is fat shaming on both sides. Yeah, I love that. Eyes on your own plate. You know, my journey with food is my journey. My biggest Roxanne Gay, or Roxanne Gay, mm-hmm. she makes me crawl the walls. Um, and I hope she hears this because I would love to get into a Twitter debate with you. Um, but she's always commenting about that. Like, why is everyone in LA not eating bread? Or, or like she had this thing on where she saw two people sitting at a table, two thin women in LA and, mm-hmm. and they were like, no, you eat the bread. No, you eat the bread. And, and she just did this whole thing on Twitter. Like a rant. It like, made me crazy. Like maybe they, I was like one, maybe they're gluten free Two, Maybe it's none of your business. Three, maybe they're training for a figure competition Four, And I made this whole list. And then someone from Australia chimed in and said, whatever, gave me like the Jennifer Lawrence eye roll gift. Like, uh. um, but yeah, as a bigger girl who has always been fat shamed, I guess, and, and felt subject to it. I, I'm to hear the others. I'm now like annoyed at all of it. It's, it's, an epidemic yeah. in our culture. You know, we're just trained to take everyone else's inventory about everything, but you're never going to find internal peace by focusing on the external environment ever. Like, I'm not going to feel good about my body by fat shaming her or by thin shaming her. You know, the girls that are struggling over the bread, maybe they both have eating disorders. Maybe they were both sexually abused and had, I'm going to take this way down. Yeah, well, we got to get to sex. So that's good. Right. Maybe they were <laughs> sexually abused and as a result of their sexual abuse, they developed an eating disorder. And as a result of their eating disorder, they were in relationships where their intimate partner raped them and then now they're fighting over the bread which has nothing to do with the bread like then fuck you for bread shaming them because this is about childhood molestation and rape now so now you're rape shaming people so you really don't know what people are struggling with it's safe to assume we're all doing the best we can so eyes on your own plate like as i become less of a dick in the world i am able to present more of a positive, less dickish, one less asshole running around. Right. You know? And I mean, total light bulb moment with eyes on your own plate. Like if I'm over here overweight, trying to make myself bigger out of a place of fear. Right. And you're over there trying to make yourself smaller out of a place of a fear. fear. It's the same damn thing. Yes. Like it's the same exact thing. It's the same thing. So like seek first to understand is a real Disordered really eating ethos. is disordered eating. Mm-hmm. And it always comes from fear and shame. Like we're all in pain. We're all struggling to some degree. We'd all feel a lot better, a lot faster if we sought to understand. Like, hello, human over there doing the thing opposite yes. for me. I see you're in pain. So am I. Like, hi from my side of the street. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm guilty of it. You know, I've I've seen this the small people and been like, well, isn't your life just easy? I've done it too. I mean, um, we all have it. She's so pretty. She must be a bitch. She's so thin. <laughs> she must suck. Like, we've all done it. Yeah. But it's 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 true. We we're all hurting. Yeah. We are. We're all hurting. Kids who act out are hurting. You know, kids who need, what's the quote? I didn't come up with this. The kids who need love the most express it 
and make it the hardest to love them or something to mm, that effect. Hard to love. Right? Mm. So people who are acting out, however, are in pain. So let's be truth tellers and pain healers and not assholes. Okay, so let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex. Speaking of truth tellers, pain healers, and assholes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a segue. Yeah. All right, so what about sex? What, I don't know. Where should we start with that? Um, well... When you don't talk about it with your kids at a young age, I mean, not a, an age-appropriate age, mm-hmm. when sex is, you know, your main, you're supposed to be a virgin when you get married and um, sex is dirty. The like, dirty thing is such a crazy word. Like, that's so Victorian, you mm-hmm. know, old school. And again, whatever your personal faith is, you know, teach your kids whatever you want. But the whole shaming people for having, like, penises and vaginas <laughs> is really not setting them up for success in the world. Right. Right. And all people who have sex issues have food issues. And almost all people with food issues have sex issues. Those are pretty, you know, inextricably linked because they both have to do with ingesting and taking in and the body. So, you know, if you heal someone of sex issues, like I'll speak like sex addiction, a sex addict in recovery is always going to turn into a food addict Mm -hmm. unless the original wound is tended to. That's interesting. And then people with alcohol tend to turn to food. Uh Like, I turned to an ice cream addict when I quit drinking. Mm -hmm. Because of the sugar and just that taking in, right? And then there's sexual anorexia. There's, you know, if you think of sex like food, there's sexual anorexia, which is like food anorexia, which I refuse to take part in anything. I won't even look at my vagina. I don't want to have sex. I don't want to think about sex. I don't want to exist from the neck down. And then there's sexual addiction, which would be like binging. So the (laughs) sex disorders are not any different than the food disorders, except they're expressed differently. And underlying all of it is unaddressed trauma, is my argument. Stop it. Yeah. So when you find yourself jumping from one negative behavior to another, Mm -hmm. you're just going to keep ping-ponging back and forth until you deal with... The origin wounds. But we said we don't have to actually know what happened. You don't need to know what happened. Okay, so how do we deal with the origin wound? You can... It can be totally acceptable just to say, you know what, something happened here. And then that commitment to reality. Mm -hmm. I need my mom to be this person. I don't want to accept that she wasn't this person. She didn't mean to not be like, no, like God love her, but she wasn't this person. And for you to heal your issues around food and sex, it might mean that you look at the people in your life in the scope of reality. That doesn't mean you need to go dumpster diving through your childhood, but it does (laughs) mean looking with the reality lens on what's true now. Who are these people in your life? What would you have to give up if you accepted the reality? Who would you have to give up? What would have to change? Like, that's a hard pill to swallow. And none of it involves, like I said, dumpster diving in childhood. And sometimes you have to give up the people. Sometimes you have to give up the people that you care about the most. And that sucks. Like, anyone that's been the partner of an addict or someone who loves someone who is an addict, telling them that you have to detach lovingly and with boundaries, but you need to take a big step back because you can't heal them because you didn't cause it, you can't cure it, and nothing you're going to do is going to control it. That's a hard sell, but it's true. Oh, my goodness. So much here, you guys. This is Britt Frank. (laughs) (laughs) My head is spinning. Um, I have a feeling we'll probably need to do this again. We need a follow-up. We covered, I think, everything. We covered everything. I'm looking at my bookshelf. I'm like, sex, I got a question for you. (laughs) Look at your bookshelf. Controlling people. Oh, letting go of your past. Toxic parents. (laughs) Jeez. Childhood (laughs) disrupted. (laughs) Tears Tears to triumph. These are fun beach reads. Yes. Father hunger. Oh, dear sweet Jesus. What was the question? (laughs) Um, Yeah, moving on. Um, Do you know people that don't have trauma? Like, (laughs) I mean, is the human condition that we're all carrying around a decent amount of trauma, we're all suffering, and the best we can do is to try and just do a little better and not be an asshole? Like, I mean, do people not suffer? Are there people out there? That's a big question. So I think there's two separate questions. Do people, are there people without trauma and... Are there people who aren't suffering? I think not everybody is suffering with symptoms that meet criteria for post-traumatic stress or complex PTSD or bipolar. Not everybody has mental illness and not everyone is symptomatic. I think the human experience is difficult. If you show me someone that claims to have absolutely nothing that was less than nurturing, nothing difficult, I would say that's a person in some serious denial. Right. Not everyone needs therapy. Not everyone needs to be in treatment. Not everyone needs the the workbook on how to manage a difficult childhood. 
but the human experience is by definition a series of obstacles that we need to overcome on our quest to being the best versions of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do think that suffering is relative and I don't know anyone that hasn't in some capacity. I mean, just if you've lived through adolescence, you've suffered. Show me someone who's (laughs) never, who claims to have not suffered, who survived puberty. Right. So, yeah, I think we're all I mean, just sprouting hair down there is suffering. Holy crap! (laughs) What is this? My body is doing these weird things. I'm bleeding for six days and I'm not dying. Like, what the hell? So, yeah, I think everyone is... And it's not about being a victim. Like, oh, play me. I have trauma. I'm suffering. Because that is not my angle. Right. It's about, you know, we're all doing the best we can. So let's try, let's sum it all up. Don't be a dick. And if for whatever reason (laughs) you're having trouble with the don't be a dick... Go work it out. Go figure out why it's so hard for you to not be a dick and stop. And then, yay, we all heal a little bit. I had to do that. It sounds like you had to do that. Yeah, I'm still a little bit. I'm still working it out. I am. Because I'm angry. Hmm. My fundamental emotion is rage. Yeah. Well, my hunch is that you were never given an outlet or permission to express it. Like, Meredith, you have the right to be angry. I, I see why you're enraged. And here's how to do rage. And there's nothing bad about anger. <laughs> here's so, how to do rage. Here's how to do rage skillfully. Get out of the pantry. That's not rage. <laughs> like, don't do rage in the pantry. Yeah. That's not going to yeah. fix it. But here's how to be angry. Here's how to be in a body and feel anger skillfully. Oh, wow. That's so good. that's a whole nother, that is. whole nother conversation. We should talk about anger. Just to help me. <laughs> this podcast is just about me. Oh, for you. Anger's I'll, great. I'll... I'll just leave it with anger is like a fire. Fire is not inherently bad. Fire in a fireplace is great. It warms us and we can rest marshmallows on it. Fire at a campfire is great. A fire, like, you know, uncontained burning through a forest is devastating. Yeah. Anger is just fuel. And if it's properly contained and tended to, it's wonderful fuel. Yeah. It's energy. It's a sign that this isn't okay. It's a sign that there was an injustice done. Like, it's actually optimistic to be angry because at some level you recognize that what happened was wrong. Yeah. All right. I asked everyone the same question at the end of the podcast. Oh, crap. Um, podcast is the same 24 hours. We all have the same 24 hours in our day, but it's what we do with it that makes our greatest health, happiness, bleh, and success. <laughs> um, I talk about that in my book, too. Happiness. Bleh. Um <laughs> What is something you do on a daily basis that makes your 24 hours great? What do you do personally? What are some tools that you've got in Mm -hmm. your toolbox? What is like one thing? The best thing I've ever found in all my journeying and studying are the practice of morning pages. Uh, Julie Cameron, The Artist's Way, that book changed my life. So every morning when I wake up before I do anything, I get out a journal and I do three stream of consciousness, longhand pages. I don't go back and reread them. When they're done, I just throw them away or I move on. But she says it's a way of stopping the thoughts from rushing at you like a pack of wild animals it's just a way to start the day present and grounded and i've do i've done that practice now for 11 years wow so you don't keep the pages no she, it's kind of like you know when you wake up in the morning the first thing you need to do is go pee yeah like generally you don't pee and then like go swimming and looking at like look my pee is green today <laughs> it's you pee you flush it's an elimination oh, wow so for me morning pages is an elimination to eliminate the the waste and sometimes they're as banal as today I need to go to the bank and my gym class is in an hour. And sometimes I feel like I'm, un- you know, I'm unlocking. I think Julie Cameron said this. I'm unlocking the secrets of the universe. But it's like working out when I don't do it and I skip the day. I feel it. That's awesome. Morning pages. Julie Cameron. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you, Brett. Thank you. Brett.